Welcome to On Top of PR with Jason Mudd, presented by Review Maxer. Hello and welcome to On Top of PR. I'm your host, Jason Mudd with Axia Public Relations. And today we're talking about strengthening a crisis comm plan dis- amid disruptions. Our guest today is Tom Chuba. He is Vice President of Communications with uh, Genesee in Wyoming. He's been a professional communicator for 15 years and currently serves as the Vice President of Communications. His diverse background includes roles in consumer PR, association marketing, and employee communications. Tom, welcome to On Top of PR. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, we're glad to have you. And, uh, you know, just so our audience knows, I saw you wrote an article for PRSA's uh, magazine, uh, Strategy and Tactics, and it caught my eye. I like how you were talking about strengthening a crisis comp uh, com plan amid uh, disruptions. And crisis communications is a big part of what we do at our agency for our clients and for companies who come to us either in crisis or expecting a crisis to occur. And uh, it's always good to connect with uh, a uh, a peer in the industry, especially who is on corporate side, who can really share a lot of uh, experience doing crisis work. So, uh, Tom, you know how you know you got your go bag packed in your car, and you're always ready to go when a crisis happens. Or are you usually staying uh, near HQ whenever you have a crisis? So in my case, usually staying in HQ, um, the challenge with my company is just the, the size of our, our footprint, right? So we have railroads, freight railroads in 43 U.S. states, five Canadian provinces, and then the U.K., Europe. Um, so I think in theory, I'd like to believe that I'd be able to be on, on the scene for a crisis. Um, yeah. But that's that's easier said than done. Yeah, sure, sure. Have you had situations where there's been like, uh, you know, if you were going to be on scene, you'd need to be two places at once, or have you kind of avoided that dilemma? No. So I'm sitting at a desk made of wood right now, and I'm going to tap it real hard. (laughs) uh, (laughs) Knock on wood, as the saying goes. Um, I've never been in in my nine years here, just celebrated nine years last week. Congratulations. uh, Never been in a situation like that. So fingers crossed. But that does not mean that my team is not prepared and practiced for such yeah. a situation. Yeah, of course, because when it rains, it pours as the other cliche goes, right? So yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, uh, so uh, do you have a crisis go bag in your car where you're ready to go at a moment's notice? Or I feel like some people have really gotten away from that since the pandemic. So you're making me second guess myself because I actually have a go bag, but it's in my office. Uh-huh. Um, and now I'm thinking, you know what? It probably does belong in my car. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but right. no, I do I do have a bag packed and ready to go. Uh, should should ever should should I ever need it? That's right. Hopefully you got your passport in it too, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, right. a copy of it. <laughs> yeah. Well, Tom, again, I'm really glad to have you on the show. Um, so let's talk. Uh, we got a few questions here for you. So is the term crisis overutilized by today's standards, would you say? I mean, uh, I think the gist of that question is that, you know, it seems like uh, in the post pandemic and during the pandemic era, uh, everything felt like a crisis for a while. So what do you think? Yeah, so I think you're onto something with that, but I would say yes to answer the question. Um, mm-hmm. But I think for me, what makes it more overused is uh, the advent of social media, yeah, um, right, and TikTok and Instagram and how everybody thinks they're a reporter nowadays with that little <laughs> device in their pocket, right? Um, you know. What is it? Every day now we see some kind of situation going down, whether it's, you know, an unruly customer at a Starbucks or an unruly passenger on a United Airlines flight. Um, Does that constitute a crisis for the company? Eh, I don't know. You know, certain things. Sure. Like a couple of years ago, Chipotle had that food poisoning, uh, mass food poisoning situation. Yes, that's a crisis. The Bud Light situation of 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 late, sure, that could be considered a, a crisis. But your typical online, your typical unruly passenger every day on on a you know well known airline, I'm not sure that a company needs to consider it a, an absolute crisis. Yeah, yeah. Well, American Airlines has just been called out uh, by name, so but uh, for for good reason, right, Tom? I mean, you know they they've had their uh, PR challenges, especially uh, post pandemic and even before that, and. Uh, anyway, uh, you know, I tell people sometimes, you know, when they're really overworked about something, you know, I just say, Hey, 
it's it's PR, not ER, right? And so you know, most of the time, uh, there's not an issue. There's there's an issue maybe, but not necessarily a crisis. Or there's just a preference of how the brand is positioned in the marketplace, not necessarily what I would call real time crisis. So I think to to your point and what we're saying here is that sometimes issues management might be a better word than crisis management, given the circum the circumstances of the situation. Does that sound fair to you? Yeah, that's a brilliant way of putting it. Yeah. Okay. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, all right. So, um, how does an organize? How does an organization go about creating a crisis communication plan if they don't have one? So, I think the first thing they have to do, if if they're new to this and they truly don't have one, and they're starting, you know, fresh from the ground up, um, yeah. I would hire an outside firm who specializes in this. Uh, at least not, to get. I you did not pay you to say that. <laughs> Um, at least to get you through that first iteration, right? right. Of getting a, a true crisis plan up and running. Um, I, I would say that that's key. Uh, yeah. Second is to think about, sit down long and hard with, with every member of your, or, you know, every executive member of your organization and think about truly what is the worst case scenario for us. Right, right. And come up with a list of, of that so that way you can come up with templated responses um, mm -hmm. that if such a situation were to arise, you'd be prepared to, to answer quickly should the media or the public be knocking on your door. Yeah, right. And it's those unexpected circumstances, right? And and just to, you know, Tom, I used to be on your side of the equation. I was always client side and, 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 and rarely, if ever, agency side. Uh, but now that I'm agency side, you know, I, I have this ability to see things that I couldn't see when I was client side. And you know, if I were working in a department, I would ask myself, how many times has people have the people in my department written a crisis plan, been involved in crisis situation and and specifically for other industries or other geographic regions and things like that, that, you know, by hiring an agency, hopefully you're getting a diversity of experience, opinions, insights and uh, and, and and all that good stuff, Tom. So, you know, to that end, you know, we've written, you know, dozens and dozens of crisis plans for a variety of industries, a variety of companies of all sizes. And we've been brought in to manage those. So that body of knowledge from our entire team can really be contributed and added value to a uh, to a crisis plan versus maybe what you can do from the inside. One of my mentors, he has a cliche and I'm going to brutalize it here, but he says something like, you know, the fishbowl looks a lot different from the outside than it does the inside. And uh, sometimes you just have the perspective of the view of the inside um, of the fish uh, bowl instead of uh, the goldfish bowl instead of the other way around. Yeah, no, I, I think that's definitely something that um, comes with age and experience. So yeah. when I was younger, previously before working uh, at the rail in, in the rail industry, as I do now, I worked in the chemical industry. So again, it was a, a yeah. very risk prone uh, or crisis prone industry. Right. Right. Um, and someone had recommended um, a firm, an outside firm, uh, for for me to look into to help us develop or, or to update our crisis plan at the time. And I was offended by that suggestion because mm -hmm. I was like, "Well, then what am I here for, right? Yeah. When you're young and you're trying to climb that ladder and trying to prove something, you're thinking, why am I going to go outside and pay somebody when when mm -hmm. I'm the director of communications? Why why don't you value my input?" But it's exactly what you said. Sometimes when you're in an organization for so long, you, you you need that outside perspective. You need to step away a little bit, um, and and an outside firm is is somebody who has a, a fresh approach and fresh eyes to something, and it's absolutely necessary. Yeah. Before we hit record, uh, I mentioned to you that um, I just got back from a speaking engagement, and Tom, while I was there, uh, you know, uh, I just uh, part of the the thing I shared was, you know, when you hire an outside agency, a lot of people, some some people will go through this idea of, well, if I'm going to hire an outside agency, then why does the company need me? And I'm worried that they might eliminate my job. Yeah. And, and it's quite the contrary, because guess what? When you have an outside agency, somebody still has to coordinate with them and somebody still has to liaison between them. But most importantly, that frees you up from doing the day to day activities and deliverables behind a computer screen and allows you to get in front of and get with your your boss, your leadership team, your executives, your department heads, uh, maybe even your board members and be a trusted advisor to them and, and elevate uh, not only the PR program, the communication program, or in some cases, the marketing program at your company, but also elevate your status and stature in the organization and be highly available to be 
an advisor and a coach and a counselor, which if you're busy knocking out the deliverables in a one person show or a small department and you're overseeing a team, unless you've got uh, an, an agency partner or good middle managers or good leaders internally within your own um, department, you're really going to have a hard time, uh, you know, being available at a moment's notice and, and being all in and really able to think strategically and think creatively and bring a fresh perspective to the table. While doing your day job, you know, right? Right. because some crises right. can go on for quite an extended period of time and yeah. the, the organization is still going to need to run. You're still going to need to do that day to day. So exactly. You're spot on. And I think the worst situations are kind of crisis that keep going are these lawsuits, right? So you have a legal yeah. legal situation and, you know, three, four or five years. I don't know. I don't want to exaggerate, but, you know, they go on and on and on and on and on. And so you feel like the crisis is happening now and it's short term. And then when that's over, suddenly lawsuits are dropping and, and legal actions are being had and conversations are happening. And so, you know, we helped a, come, an organization in crisis, you know, years ago. And uh, pre-pandemic, and uh, just the other day, they were finally, you know, their legal matter was finally closed out, um, you know, after all these years. And, and they were very grateful to us. And, you know, some of the ideas we brought to them, they were able to use as part of their legal defense. And it worked out great for them. But for years, they were under this cloud until they could just get it all cleared up. Yeah. All right. So how does an organization go about updating an existing crisis plan? And, and Tom, maybe whether it's your personal uh, recommendation or the corporate uh, policy, but how often are you uh, recommending that people uh, update their crisis plan? I would say at least once a year uh, mm -hmm. at a minimum. And I think the best way to update it is just to keep an eye on your industry. Um, just you know, keep keep track of anything that's going on that's making news or making mm -hmm. headlines. Um, watching how companies are responding, um, particularly if it's a crisis, and then kind of reviewing what you have in place and, and, and tweaking it based on what you're seeing uh, in real time. Yeah, I like that a lot. Um, and uh, that's exactly what we do. We, we watch for situations, Tom, where other organizations are in crisis or they're going through a crisis and what they do well, what they do bad. And we are often making notes in our own internal files um, for crisis communications. And sometimes you'll see a soundbite, a quote or a media statement, and you're like, that's gold. Let's write that down. Yeah. Let's copy and paste that. Let's put this in our idea uh, list for future times. Or, you know, let's copy that whole communication, the media statement and email message that was sent to employees or whatever. And then we can always be inspired and borrow from it later when we need it. The other thing we do is we watch for the issues, right? The issues that are happening. And so we say, okay, so what do you do if one day your company, you know, has a product recall like these guys did? And, you know, or maybe, you, maybe you're monitoring a competitor and you're like, gosh, I never thought that could happen in our industry, but it did, you know? And so in, in your particular case, right, uh, you know, trains derail, and there's stuff on those trains. Well, some company might not be in the, uh, the the freight or rail business or logistics business, so they never think about it. But then again, they are in the logistics business if their products are being uh, transported, right? Whether it's indirect or direct. And if their product is on there and it causes supply chain issues or it causes um, quality issues or just their products laying in the streets, right? Um, or, uh, in, you know, created a litter, then that becomes a problem for them and their organization that they probably never thought much about. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a great point. I mean, certain industries are, you're going to have to lean on, I guess, your partners, for lack of a better term, right? Uh, if, if we're transporting goods for for a client um, or, or a customer and yeah. that customer's product is involved in an incident, they're going to need to have a, a crisis response as well. So, so probably part of updating that plan is just keeping track of your customer base or your client base um, and making sure that you're touching base with them as well uh, to ensure that they're going to be on your side or, or work with you through a crisis. Yeah, we worked with a, uh, a large global um, com uh, publicly traded company for about 10 years. Great people run a good business, you know, smart, high integrity, all these good things. And they never experienced a crisis while we were working with them. But the reason they hired us you know, before that was they had a crisis. They had no PR counsel in house. So that after the dust settled, they said, hey, we got to find a PR firm. We got to start doing PR to build uh, or strengthen our brand and protect our, our reputation in the marketplace. So for seven years, we worked with them doing preemptive and proactive PR. Everything was great. 
And, uh, you know, they were certainly paying us well enough to cover us to do crisis, but they just didn't need us. And then one year they had seven crisis events happen within 12 months, not because they did anything Ouch. wrong in their company. Right. It was just, you know, in the act of doing business. Right. And so during that process, they really leveraged us and said, man, we got our money's worth out of you guys this year. And I was like, yes, you did. So, you know, it, and, and my point is, is to to your point is you don't know. You don't know when it's going to happen, but you know it is going to happen. As you know, as long as you're in business, uh, the longer you're in business, the more likely it's going to happen. And so, you know, to my next point, I want to talk about social media just a little bit and, and how that's changed and how how uh, that's changed crisis. And I started to think of some of these legacy companies that have been around 100 years. Maybe they've been fortunate not had a crisis situation in you know uh, 15, 20 years. Um, but you know, now's the time really to kind of dust off that. Uh, communications plan and make sure you're accounted for all the modern technologies of the day of today that we have. They do equip you well uh, to, you know, but you still have to use them responsibility responsibly. So the cliche of, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. And so just because you can text message all of your customers or tag at everyone on a social media channel doesn't mean you should do that unless the circumstances dictate. So can you really manage social media and social media chatter and social media activists during a crisis? What do you think, Tom? I think it's becoming harder by the day, um, right. right? Like I remember when, when social media first hit the scene, I was very young in my career. And the thought process at that time was you have to respond to every comment that's out there. Yeah. I think nowadays that would be impossible. Um, mm -hmm. Even if you hire an outside firm, right. Or, or if you have a large in-house communications team, um, what you, what, what would help is to have an outside uh, media pl monitoring platform uh, that can kind of, work through the noise for you yeah. mm -hmm. uh, to help you identify the issues. Um, and that'll, you, you're only going to be able to respond to, to, to the things that are going to move the needle. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is my advice uh, for mm -hmm. companies out there um, who are going through a crisis. And, and, and I, I think it's just, it's just flat out difficult nowadays yeah. to think that you're going to be able to respond to everything and truly manage the noise on social media. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, Tom, we're going to take a quick break and be right back on the other side to talk more um, about crisis and strengthening a crisis communications plan. Uh, thank you for being here, Tom, and we'll be right back. You're listening to On Top of PR with your host, Jason Mudd. Jason is a trusted advisor to some of America's most admired and fastest growing brands. He is the managing partner at Axia Public Relations, a PR agency that guides news, social, and web strategies for national companies. And now, back to the show. Hello, and welcome back to On Top of PR. Uh, thank you for the quick break while we uh, rehydrated and, uh, and got a little bit more organized on our end, but we're glad you're still with us. Uh, and Tom is still here. Tom, good to see you again. And uh, we just kind of want to wrap this up uh, as we enter our second half of the show. We want to talk about just kind of in your experience, what are some lessons learned you have from crisis communication that you sense our audience would benefit from hearing? And hopefully if they're not driving, they're going to take some notes here because uh, I think we've got some really good. Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> yeah, right. Because then you'll have your own crisis that you have to deal with. Exactly, right? exactly. All right. Uh, so that that's hard to whittle down, but let me see if I can get these down to like half dozen. Does that sound good? Um, that sounds great. First and foremost, I would say, I, I feel like this is pretty standard nowadays, but uh, just ensure that your website content management system allows for like swift modifications mm, and includes em good. emergency response banners. Um, yeah. WordPress is who we use at my company. They're great for that. Uh, I know Squarespace is good as well, um, but you just want to be able to switch something on really quickly nowadays. Uh, and it shouldn't be this this whole to do to get a crisis message up there. It's not like, you know, five or 10 years ago when you had a HT, HTML code, everything. Um, second thing I would say is plan during a crisis, plan to provide at least one update per day. I created my own little motto that no update is still an update. I think mm. that's super important today. Uh, with the news cycle, it's okay to you know go out there and say that you know cleanup is still underway, or road right. close the road closures are still in effect, uh, yeah. or we're working as quickly and diligently as we can to restore service. Mm -hmm. um, just just letting people know that you're you're there working on on the situation, I think, goes a really long way. Mm -hmm. um, next thing I would say is make sure you have a really good comprehensive plan for potential town halls with the public. 
um, that's the last place that you want something to go wrong, right? Because not only are you going to have media and uh, local government there, but you're going to have members of the public there. And what are they going to have? They're going to have this in their hand. Um, and if anything goes wrong, it's likely going to be filmed by them, not by the media. Uh, so just just have a plan to, to be able to successfully execute a town hall without angering the people who are affected by your crisis. Um, next thing I would say is probably simple. If, if you're in an industry like mine, the railroad industry, we are just acronym heavy. I could throw five or 10 at you right now that, mm-hmm. that would go right over your head. You'd have no idea what it means. Simplify your industry terminology now so that you don't have to do it later because you do not want to use any kind of acronyms or or technical language uh, in your crisis communications. You want to make sure everybody's understanding what you're saying. Um, next thing I would say is probably tap into your industry uh if your industry has a premier membership association and most industries do nowadays, right. Um, tap into them, uh, lean on them and, and allow them to help. Um, so specifically for the railroad industry, uh, if, if we were to have a derailment, um, at my company, uh, they would be able to speak about the industry as a whole, right? So while I'm speaking about to the media and giving messages yeah. about my company's specific response, they'll be able to talk mm-hmm. about how safe or how regulated the railroad industry is as a whole. And that's definitely going to enhance your message and enhance your story. And I'd say the final thing is probably engage government representatives. Um, in, in a crisis, uh, government officials can either enhance your crisis response or they can terribly hinder it. So you want to make sure you have those relationships with those people, whether it's local, state, federal, right, at the senator level. Um, if applicable, you want to have those relationships before a crisis happens because you're going to need to lean on them um, to, to help you get your message across and, and for them to to verify your message. Last thing you want is for them to give a conflicting message about your company or about your response. So yeah. that's what I would say is are probably my biggest lessons learned. Hopefully that's not too many, um, but those those definitely resonate for me this year. Yeah, those are good, Tom. Those are good. So let's kind of back and forth here for just a minute. You kind of mentioned several things. I really like it. Um, So one thing that came to mind is you were describing kind of like a CMS to update your website, right? And uh, and to that end, I know years ago, they used to call like having the ability to to make a dark site live, right? And and, and now that the dark web is kind of a term, maybe maybe there's another (laughs) term for that. But, you know, the idea is that you've got a site that you don't promote, you don't publicize, but it's ready to go live in a moment where the first thing people see is that crisis. And some people have done banners and pop-ups. And, you know, I know during the pandemic, everybody had like that red line that said, we're still open for business, you know, and that kind of thing. So I think that's good. And then the other thing that triggered me, Tom, is is when you said WordPress and and Squarespace. You know, I thought to myself, okay, if you're using a you know a, a, a very consumer friendly web uh, interface like that, you probably need to add to your crisis plan. What happens if we get hacked, or what happens if our site gets you know uh, gets sprayed or something like that? Because I remember that's I, an excellent point. Yeah, I was on vacation one year, um, and my phone rang, and somebody from the office was calling, saying, you know, and we weren't responsible for any of these websites but they're like seven of our clients had their website hijacked overnight and now there's really uh inappropriate images and stuff all over their page and all that stuff and uh and i was like oh i'm glad i'm on vacation no (laughs) i i i I said okay and so what are we doing about it and they told me and they said some of our clients are saying hey they don't want to work with their web company again i said well it's not necessarily their website company's problem but just like Windows tends to be a target for viruses, WordPress and these other sites tend to be a target for getting hacked. And if they can find a, a plugin that's vulnerable or a port that's open or something like that, there's lots of ways. But my point is, is when you said that, I was like, you know what? Our audience needs to know they need to prepare for these things, right? So whether it's a, you know, now we call it cybersecurity, but you know, when this happened 10 years ago, it was just, you know, my website got hacked. So make sure cybersecurity is something you're thinking about, right, folks? So, you know, you might be in the rail business and you've got rail crisis plans, but what happens when things happen otherwise? Um, you mentioned town halls and that got me thinking, Tom, also, we recently did a town hall with a client and I really love this. So we had very personable, likable people greeting people who were coming to the town hall. 
as soon as they got there. And, you know, like, here's the restrooms, here's where we're doing this or whatever. And they're just people like that were ambassadors from the brand that were, I don't know, my client must have looked high and low to find the nicest people that work in the company, the people that you would never want to say anything mean to or hurt their feelings. And that was the first impression you got. So you're coming in, this big company is doing X, Y, and Z, and I'm not happy. And then you meet the nicest person in the world who's your new best friend, right? And then they literally escorted them to the area of the um, <clears throat> town hall where they wanted to go in. And what my client, what we did, which I thought was really smart, we did not set up a town hall where there's a traditional mic and stage and audience it was a walkthrough tour of you know we set up it, it reminded me of like your grade school science fair right so there are different stations or exhibits set up along the way so no one person no there was no microphone right so nobody could kind of take over the meeting in the town hall and instead it was a forum to walk around and get educated on what we were doing and then there's an expert, an independent expert at each station, either representing the engineering firm, the architecture firm, the uh, the county government who was involved. And so each station was staffed by somebody who knew way more than anyone else who was going to show up and could address their questions or their the myths they heard, the rumors they heard. There were maps and visuals that they could point and walk people through. So when everyone was leaving, they felt like, I learned a lot and the person who makes decisions or can influence decisions heard my concerns, addressed my concerns, wrote down my questions, my name and number and all that. And that was something I thought was a fantastic event. I was really proud of it. Yeah. I love that. I'm, I'm yeah. going to borrow these. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So my own. Yeah, yeah, please do. Please do. And then when you mentioned about, you know, just kind of having your acronyms and all that, I started thinking to myself, wouldn't it be great if we had like a glossary of terms for media, again, to be helpful, like you're covering an industry you probably never covered before. Here's some basics. Here's what you need to know to be able to cover it, you know, savvy and all that good stuff. Especially um, nowadays with the disappearance of the beat reporter, right? Nobody's assigned to a specific what's that? <laughs> beat anymore. Right, yeah. What's that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, yeah. I love that. That's good. And then you the, you inspired this idea. I really like this, which is, you know, um, I wrote down, have expert sources pre-identified and ready to be available. Because, you know, in, in media relations, you're trying to hand deliver a story to a journalist where it's, you know, in our case, our client, or in your case, your company. Oh, and three other people, two or three other people you could also talk to that would help round out this story. Here's their name, here's their number or whatever. And maybe somebody you already have a relationship with that you know is a credible person instead of them calling some, you know, rando down the street who, you know, or they just thought would call and, and you know, whatever. And they don't know the first thing about what they're talking about versus you helping them find somebody who's really credible and understands the business and can speak to it independently, but with that independence and as well as authority and experience. So I like that as well. Yeah. So Tom, this has been a good collaboration session. Yeah, this was fun. Yeah. If other people want to get in touch with you, maybe they heard the episode and they're like, oh my gosh, I love what Tom said. I've got follow-up questions, or maybe they want to invite you to come speak to their group or their uh, association. Uh, what's the best way for them to get a hold of you? LinkedIn. Okay. Tried and true. LinkedIn, yeah. Tom Chuba, T-O-M-C-I-U-B-A. And that's exactly how I reached out to you as well. And uh, It is. And, and if you're a loyal member of our audience, you know, I always say this, always tell them why you're connecting with them and how you heard about them instead of just hitting that connect button. And they're like, I don't know who this Jason Mudd guy is. Why would I connect with him? That will make you stand out way more and create a be much better first impression, especially if you're in the communication field for crying out loud. So, yeah, Tom, this has been great. Thanks again. Uh, we will. Uh, be sure to put links in the episode notes to Tom's LinkedIn. We'll also put some other resources in there. There'll be a transcript. Uh, there'll be playback links to your favorite platform and a great way for you to refer a friend who you might think, gosh, this episode would really help a colleague of mine or a friend of mine in the business. So with that, this is Jason Mudd from Axia PR signing off. And uh, thank you for allowing us the opportunity to help you stay on top of PR. This has been On Top of PR with Jason Mudd, presented by ReviewMaxer. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode and check out past shows at ontopofpr.com.